Cain is deified. The clans tell tales of him. Few know the truth. He was mortal once, as were we all. However, his contempt for humanity drove him to create me and my brethren. I am Razael, firstborn of his lieutenants. I stood with Cain and my brethren at the dawn of the Empire. I have served him a millennium. Since the release of Legacy of Kain Soul Reaver on the PlayStation 1 in August of 1999, fans of the series have long speculated about Raziel's life during the rise of Kain's empire. Unfortunately, much of the information we know about Raziel's vampire days is exclusively tied up in background materials and interviews with the developers. The opening cutscene for Soul Reaver offers a glimpse into Raziel's final moments as a vampire before he is brutally executed by Kane and transformed into a wraith. While this scene is fantastic and might just be my favourite introduction of any game to date, it leaves a feeling of wanting to know more about Raziel's life leading up to this moment. So I had a thought. Why not compile the key information we do have about this intriguing period in Raziel's history and present that in a video? Now some people might not be aware of this, but the game manual for Soul Reaver actually provides a valuable background story which is recounted by Raziel himself. Raziel narrates a millennium has passed since Lord Kane set his capital in the ruins of the Pillars of Nosgoth and began his conquest of the world. His first act was to recruit a cadre. Dipping into the underworld, Kane snared six souls and thus birthed his lieutenants, of which Raziel was one. The lieutenants in turn prowled the twilight of purgatory, building six legions of vampires to pillage Nosgoth. Raziel later goes on to state that the humans think it's a poison of the blood that makes vampires what they are. He accuses the humans of being fools, as the blood only feeds the bodies they live in. Raziel explains to create a vampire through necromancy, one must steal a soul from the abyss to reanimate the corpse. It is the body that demands the blood sacrifice. A vampire's soul gains their advantage from the powers of the underworld. Although Raziel acknowledges he was once human, he had no idea he was Seraphan, the antithesis of everything he believed as a vampire. Following the events of Blood Omen 1, Cain needed allies to overthrow the selfish humans who dominated the land. However, he soon realised he was incapable of turning living beings into vampires, and so Cain devised an unconventional means of siring offspring. He raided the tomb of his ancient enemy, the fanatical order of warrior priests, once sworn to eradicate vampires. Deep within the crypt, he found the corpses of six commanders who led the Seraphim Brotherhood in Nosgoth's early history. They were well entombed, and their bodies spared the decay of the grave. By breathing a small portion of his soul into each corpse, Kane was able to draw a commander's original soul back into its body, reviving it as a fledgling vampire. The developers would later clarify that a portion of a vampire's soul had to be transported into the vessel to call back the original soul and curse it, fusing it with undead life. Fortunately for Cain, Raziel and his brethren had retained no memories of their former lives as Seraphim vampire hunters. They had been too long dead to recall anything from their pasts, and remained completely ignorant of their Seraphim roots. This would prove advantageous for Cain, as he gained the loyalty and skills of six powerful warriors, with none of the zealotry of religious extremists who hate vampires. One must keep his friends close, Raziel, and his enemies even closer. Can you grasp the absurd beauty of the paradox? We are the same. Seraphan and vampire. With our holy wars, our obsession with Nosgoth's domination, who better to serve me than those whose passion transcends all notions of good and evil? It's hard to know for sure what kind of personality Raziel had when he was first raised, as his character has changed much over the centuries. 
As a mortal man, he was a ruthless warrior who took pleasure in the purging of vampires in his quest to rid the world of his perception of evil. As a vampire, he terrorised humanity by helping Cain establish his empire. During this period, he shared Cain's opinion that vampires were a superior form of being and therefore deserved their place as the dominant species in the world. It appears then, whatever conditions and situations Raziel finds himself in dictates his world view. While you can make the argument that it was immoral for him to hunt down and kill humans mercilessly as he did, such actions were acceptable and even commendable in Cain's empire. For much of his existence, Raziel was, in many ways, a product of his environment. As the first of Cain's lieutenants to be raised, he received the largest portion of Cain's soul and became his strongest servant. He enjoyed Cain's favour as the firstborn and returned his master's trust in him with complete loyalty and devotion to their cause. There's no doubt Raziel was granted a position of extreme privilege. Ultimately, his rank made him want to behave in an honourable manner befitting of Cain's second in command. Together, we forged the legions that subjugated Nosgoth. It is said that Cain's rise to power was swift and brutal. It took a mere 100 years for Cain to conquer Nosgoth after bestowing his six lieutenants with the Dark Gift. In that time, humanity had been thoroughly subjugated and a new vampire civilization came to reign over the land. Now I know some of you might not be the biggest fans of the multiplayer spin-off title Nosgoth, but written commentary from the developers of that game has provided some worthwhile lore on Cain's conquest. Raziel and his brethren were essential to Cain's ascension. They built the six great clans which would form the legions necessary to bring humanity to the brink of collapse. In the early part of the war, the clans were forced to rely on subterfuge and vampire scouts were sent to corrupt and destroy large human settlements from within. The clan's strength lay in their necromancy, for every human murdered was a potential soldier to be added to their ranks. Needing safe locations to sire fledglings, the clans constructed hidden underground compounds. Mortal soldiers slain in battle were dragged to these fortresses beneath the earth. Their bodies were granted a portion of an elder vampire's soul, which was then used to call back the original soul of the departed, twisting and binding it to form a new vampire. As Nosgoth's major kingdoms fell one by one, the humans realised Cain's forces proved a credible military threat. In a last ditch effort to defend their territories, the human nations united to stand against the ever-growing vampire plague. Enormous battles ensued, but in the end, humanity could not resist the might of the clans, as those mortals killed continued to awaken with inhuman purpose, hungry for the blood of their former comrades. In Soul Reaver 1's game manual, Raziel remarks that after taming the humans, the clan's real work began, the shaping of Nosgoth to their will. Around the pillars, thousands of human slaves laboured and died to construct the magnificent sanctuary of the clans. In Raziel's own words, never had the world known a time of such beauty. However, with no enemies left to fight, Raziel and his brothers grew bored. And in their boredom, they found other ways to amuse themselves. The lieutenants allowed their legions, the lesser vampires, to have their intrigues. Rivalries and even assassinations were tolerated, but outright warfare among the clans was strictly forbidden. The fledglings provided amusement and spice to an increasingly uninspired court. As faction fell against faction, Raziel and his brethren placed bets upon the outcome. They aided and foiled plots at their whim. Lead artist for the series, Daniel Kabuko, has shared his thoughts on the power dynamics and the personalities of the lieutenants during this era. His comments are useful because they give us an insight into what guided his visual designs for the major enemies present in Soul Reaver 1. According to Kabuko, the vampire Raziel was passionate and charming. He'd be very persuasive with his words, but just as easily slide a knife between your ribs without breaking pace. 
He grew to enjoy the game of twisting relationships to his advantage. He loved to show off his status, but enjoyed the company of his closest brothers, Tyrell and Duma. Tyrell was militant and fierce, growing into arrogance and seeing things on a large scale. His temperament was direct and powerful. He believed nothing was stronger than the vampire race, and according to sources from Nosgoth's development team, he was tasked by Kane with defeating the one true obstacle to the vampire's domination of Nosgoth, the sun. The proud Tyrellian built their cities under the harsh landscape of Nosgoth's northern wastes, where survival would hone their strength. As one of the most dutiful of all the clans, they built the first of many large furnaces to emit smoke into the sky, shielding fledglings from the sun's deadly rays. As for Duma, he was tactical and precise, often looking for an advantage and a way to increase his skills. He loved pitting his abilities against strong adversaries and taking them apart both physically and mentally before finally putting them down. There was no sport in killing a helpless opponent, so he preferred confronting a challenger on a battlefield. He loved fighting and took any opportunity to show off his skill. Raziel, who was also fond of combat, enjoyed sparring with his brother Dumar. And while it frustrated Dumas to consistently lose to Raziel in single combat, it's my belief that the two brothers shared a mutual respect for one another. My brother Dumas, a powerful warrior in life, he would have burned with shame to have me find him here like a stuck pig. I imagine Raziel's relationships with his younger brothers to be less affable. Kabuko says Rahab was daring and driven, almost to a point of obsession, pushing the limits of his body so that he could develop a unique resistance to water. As the middle child, Rahab was worried about being overlooked by Cain, who he deeply revered, so he sought to prove himself in his own way. I don't think there was any bad blood as such between Raziel and Rahab. Certainly, there were periods where they were jealous of each other, Rahab would have looked upon Raziel's position as Cain's favourite with envy, and Raziel would have reacted with weary surprise upon learning Rahab had overcome his vulnerability to water, thus winning Cain's favour for a time. But apart from these moments, my guess is that Raziel and Rahab got on fine with neither of them really interfering with the other's business. Zephon, however, was a deceiver. Kabuko describes him as scheming and suspicious, always sending out spies and seeking information to exploit a weakness. He preferred the art of the ambush, attacking indirectly. He saw value in planning for the future and had the greatest stock of blood in storage, sometimes using it to barter. Zephon was easily the most cunning and cruel of the lieutenants, and honestly, I reckon he was fixated on interfering with the affairs of his eldest sibling, Raziel. How the vendetta between Raziel and Zephon started is unclear, but I think we can safely assume there was no love lost between them. Their bitter interaction in Soul Reaver 1 is proof enough of that. Raziel considered him cowardly, untrustworthy, dangerous, and without honour, whereas Zephon likely despised his brother for treating him as someone not worthy of respect. Perhaps things have not changed as much as you'd like to believe, you were always weak, Zephon, and once again, you will bend to my will. Although Raziel was frequently at odds with Zephon, I suspect such feelings of hatred and distrust did not extend to his younger sibling, Melkiah. It's said Melkiah was cruel and methodical. He'd torture and experiment on humans to graft their skins onto his body. He was prone to bursts of rage, and it's easy to see why. Having been made last, he received the poorest portion of Cain's soul, and therefore his body retained a number of its previous humanoid imperfections. He was forced to skin the corpses of those he killed to replace his own decaying skin. While Raziel presumably found the whole grafting process distasteful, it wouldn't surprise me if our protagonist felt a degree of pity for his little brother for having to go through this exercise. Over time, we became less human and more divine. Cain would enter the state of change and emerge with a new gift. Some years after the Master, 
our evolution would follow until I had the honor of surpassing my lord. As vampires mature, their bodies undergo change. Once turned, their previously human looking features would transform and develop certain characteristics of the ancient forebearers of vampire kind. Fans would replace teeth, ears would acquire a distinctive peak, and eyes would change colour. Once their evolution had progressed far enough, a vampire's fingers would meld together to become claws, and they would eventually sport hooves where once they had human feet. Vampire metamorphosis played an important function in their society. Younger, less altered fledglings would make up a legion's lower ranks, whereas those further along the evolutionary path would be given more trusted positions. These elder vampires would provide counsel to their lieutenant patriarch, ensuring orders were followed and the hierarchy upheld. It was Cain and his lieutenants who displayed the most marked transformations. Periodically, Cain would enter a state of pupation and emerge with new powers. His lieutenants would follow a decade or so later, with each receiving ever more distinct gifts, facets of which would in turn go on to be exhibited by their respective clans. As seen in game, the Zephonim could scale walls, and the Rahabim grew impervious to water, all thanks to the transmutations of their patriarchs. Now the sole progenitor of the vampire race, Cain set himself up as a god emperor to be worshipped and feared. As his earthly body evolved into a higher form of being, he ascended to godhood. With each change, the trivial affairs of vampire and man held less interest for him. Always, it was Cain that would change first, before the others. That was until Raziel happened to lapse into the period of evolution before his master and was gifted with bat-like wings. I've seen a few people ask why Cain was supposedly so upset with Raziel for growing wings when Rahab had done something similar. After all, Rahab was granted gills and scaly blue skin giving him a unique ability to submerge himself in water, something not even Cain could do. Well, what you have to understand is that it wasn't that Raziel evolved into something greater than Cain, but the fact that he evolved before Cain. Rather than gradually changing over time, vampires experience periods of accelerated metamorphosis, entering dormant states from which they emerge transformed. For centuries, they did this in order, with Cain being first, then Raziel, and so on and so forth. When word first reached the Razielim that their patriarch had the audacity to evolve ahead of their godlike master, grave concerns brewed amongst the clan's leaders. Background lore for the multiplayer spin-off Nosgoth mentions how many of the Razielim took it as an act of blasphemy, while others saw it as a blessing. In the end, all were united in their fear over how, or even if, Raziel should present this development to Cain. For his part though, Raziel remained unconcerned. Shortly after the first Soul Reaver game was shipped out, a comic serving as a brief prequel to the game was released. The comic features the vampire Raziel in a story just prior to his execution. Raziel is feeding on what appears to be a human female, whilst reflecting on Cain's conquest to subjugate Nosgoth and enslave humanity. He suddenly realises something is wrong. The woman's blood is neither mortal nor vampiric. He throws her across the room and demands to know what manner of creature she is. She identifies herself as a construct of the Elder Gods, sent to deliver him a prophetic warning. She tells Raziel Cain's empire is nearing its end, that the immortality of vampires has meant that souls are stuck in limbo which has compromised the fragile balance between life and death. The entity comments on Raziel's wings, claiming that Cain will not tolerate such an affront to his supreme divinity. She claims Cain, in his jealous rage, will tear the wings from Raziel's back before casting him into the lake of the dead. The water will burn like white hot fire, destroying everything Raziel is, but instead of perishing, he will live on as a wraith. It appears this creature was sent as a messenger by the Elder God itself, 
likely to plant the idea in Raziel's mind that Kane's cruel actions would be done out of jealousy and spite. As we discover near the end of the series, this was all a deception on Kane's part. He cared little about Raziel's alleged transgressions against him. Instead, he was far more concerned with challenging fate and restoring the land to its former beauty. Kane knew he needed Raziel to be reborn as a creature of free will, and the only way he could accomplish this was to sentence his most loyal servant to the abyss. In the next panel, we see Raziel accuse the entity of lying. Enraged, the vampire rips her head from her shoulders, attacking her for trying to turn him against his brethren. Raziel says he cannot risk letting this creature tempt one less resolute than himself, but what remains of the decapitated head merely laughs at him mockingly. I am your future, Raziel, says the creature. Look at me and see what will become of that handsome face. Raziel continues to argue with the disembodied head. It then goes on to predict that his brothers will devolve into warped monsters and that Raziel will murder all of them, consumed by fratricide. Notably, here the comic makes a direct reference to some of the material Crystal Dynamics were forced to remove, including the priestess and the events at the pinnacle of the Silence Cathedral. The creature states that Raziel will kill the High Priestess of the Vampire Worshippers, and that the bells of the Silence Cathedral will ring out across the land. Encouraging him to unveil the secrets of the Ancients, she urges him to embrace his future. At this stage, Raziel's patience has reached its limit. He discards the creature's remains into a nearby fire, rejecting her claims whilst reaffirming his allegiance to Cain. He declares he does not fear his master as he knows the truth, that he, along with all vampires, were once mortal, and Cain chose Raziel to share in his divinity. The comic ends with Raziel having complete faith in Cain, he departs to meet the council at the Sanctuary of the Clans to present his new wings to his lord. Unfortunately for Raziel, the creature's predictions would prove to be mostly correct. For my transgression, I earned a new kind of reward. Ah! Agony. That brings this video to a close. You know, I think the rise of Kane's empire would be a fascinating era to explore in a future installment, especially as an action-adventure game which is primarily story-driven. In my view, it'd be fun to control a vampire Raziel leading his clan and navigating the politics of Nosgoth with his brothers as they set out to conquer the world. If a developer is feeling really ambitious, they could even have the game span over the millennium leading up to Raziel's execution. It's just something to think about now that we know a new game is being considered. Of course, my opinion is that they should remake Blood Omen and Soul Reaver first, and if those titles are successful, then perhaps they can attempt something like this. I plan to dedicate a future video to discuss my thoughts about what I would like to see in a potential Legacy of Kane remake or sequel. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the video, and please feel free to comment down below. I do enjoy reading your observations about these games, and I appreciate your feedback. All the best everyone.